So you're all tired, huh? A few hours of lectures. I see everyone here is a pre-med student, is that right? Yes. Actually, in the background. They start real early now. Otherwise, you know, it's a tough, it's a tough thing. It's an arms race. All right. Well, thank you all for having me. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I thought I was supposed to talk about, which is, you know, a little bit about my background, what we do at UCSF. I'm a hemonc doctor. I practice at the general. And, uh, <laughs> and I'll tell you a little bit about the research we do. All right, so I'm a hemonc doc. I work at UCSF, and I practice at San Francisco General Hospital. You'll find me there most Mondays. And I also attend on service maybe about three, four months a year. And if anyone's ever interested in coming by and spending some time with us, you're all welcome. You're welcome to come by sometime and shadow us. And what am I in one line? I'm a hemonc doctor who I guess his specialty is critically evaluating evidence. All right, my journey. I'm from the Midwest. People always say, where are you from? I say outside Chicago, but it's kind of a ways outside. LaPorte, Indiana, there you see it right there by Notre Dame. I don't know, has anyone had the misfortune, I mean fortune of being out here? No, okay, all right, it's the middle of nowhere. I knew when I graduated high school I just wanted to get out of there, so I'm glad to be in San Francisco. I did my college at Michigan State University. My major was philosophy. Uh, I did the pre-med requirements, but actually my interest was philosophy. And uh, this is our commencement speaker, Maya Angelou, uh, who I was fortunate enough to meet. Look how grainy that photo is. That was the quality of cameras back in the day, a long time ago. I did my medical school at University of Chicago, so not far from where I'm from. Uh, this was my med school roommate. Uh, we lived together in Chicago. He now practices anesthesiology in Vacaville, so still not far. Then I spent some time at Northwestern University. I did internal medicine training, which is the same training that the last gentleman probably did. You do three years of general medicine training. Then you decide what you want to specialize in, cardiology, oncology, nephrology. Uh, these are the subspecialties of medicine. You probably heard from other people today who did orthopedic surgery. That's something you decide, what, just out of medical school, surgery. Um, I did my three years also in the city of Chicago. These are some of my, my classmates from those times. Then I spent uh, the next three years at the National Institutes of Health in Washington, D.C. That's where I did medical oncology, hematology. Uh, I think this photo was taken when I gave a talk in Hawaii in those years. Um, during my time at the NIH as a hemonc fellow, I did a master's in public health at Johns Hopkins University. You all here at Berkeley have a great master's in public health program, too. So those are, I think, two excellent programs for people interested in public health epidemiology. Then I took a job at Oregon Health and Science University in Portland, Oregon. The, the owner of Nike Shoes, Phil Knight, he donated a billion dollars to the university and they said, it's time to hire people. And so that's how I got hired out there. Um, I enjoyed my time in Portland. I worked there for five years on the faculty. I was an assistant and then associate professor there. And then at last, I moved to the University of California, San Francisco. <laughs> From 2020 until death, probably death. You know, once you get the pension going here, it's hard to let it go. So here I am at UCSF. All right, my current job, I'm a hemonc doctor, so what does that mean? I guess we take care of everything from iron deficiency anemia in a 20-year-old woman who has heavy menstrual bleeding to somebody born with hemophilia who bleeds a lot to somebody with a blood cancer like leukemia or multiple myeloma to a young college student with Hodgkin's lymphoma, it's not that uncommon, to everybody with gastric cancer and uh, colon cancer and all of the cancers that typically are associated with aging. And I get to pick when I went to UCSF where I wanted to work. I chose to work at the General, which is our county hospital. And I chose to work in the county hospital because you get to see a little bit of everything. You still get to see the range of hematology and oncology. If you work at UCSF, the main campus, I joke that we have doctors for the left kidney cancer and the right kidney cancer. I mean, that's how specialized they've gotten. Uh, it's only a little bit of a joke. There are doctors who only do kidney cancer, only do bladder cancer, only do breast cancer. So that's how specialized they are. For me, that would be boring, and so I couldn't do that. So I wanted to go practice somewhere where I had some variety, and uh, that was always been my preference. I'm a professor in the Department of Epidemiology, um, so I teach many classes to the medical students. I teach the first year epidemiology courses where you learn the basics, sensitivity, specificity. You learn about diagnostic tests and incidence and prevalence and all those kinds of things. Um, I also teach courses in the master's program for people who choose to do that. And then I'm a researcher. I run a laboratory. You can visit our website. And basically what we do is we do research in health policy. So we care about the cost of cancer drugs, how drugs are approved, why drugs are approved, how well they work, 
cancer screening tests? Should we be doing them when they don't work so well? Um, and COVID-19 policy. Some of you may know that I've got interested in that. And I have a lot of evidence-based disagreements with a lot of things we did for many years, which I think have created some serious problems. All right, so that's my background. I'm gonna tell you a story from clinic, but first let me pause and just say, any questions so far? I guess that's the basics. Yes? Why did you pursue your master's in public health? When did I do it? Why did you? Why did I do it? That's a question I ask myself every day, why? <laughs> uh, when did I do it? I did it when I was at the NIH. So I was a Hemonk fellow, you're committed to be there for three years. And you've got about 18 months of hard hospital work where you're going sleepless nights, but you've got 18 months for research. Then I found out that there's a program at NIH that would pay for you to do an MPH. So I was like, all right, it's gonna be free. Okay, that sounds about the, the right amount of money. And then I found out I could fit it into my research here while I was doing research. And I thought to myself, well, in that case, uh, maybe it's worth it. Having done it, I will be honest with you and I'll tell you, there are like three or four classes that I'm really glad I took. The biostatistical courses, programming and statistics, and probably the PhD courses in epidemiology. And then there are dozens and dozens of classes I took that I'm, frankly, I don't know if I should have been taking. I mean, I'm not sure it was the best use of my time just to get to the 80 credit hours. For instance, I took a class on the health effects of war. And spoiler alert, it's not good. So I mean, you know, they spent a lot of time to teach you that war is bad. And I kind of had that intuition going into the class. I'm not sure I learned much from that class other than what I thought to be true. But statistics class, I think, is very useful. So that's why I did it. I had, by that time, I had decided I was going to be a researcher. I think when I, oh, it cut out. Oh, there we go. There you go. A little more juice left in the tank. Oh, but it's saying the battery's running low. So if anyone has two double A's, you can be a hero today. All right, so um, when I went to medical school, honestly, I was, frankly, I was lying like everybody else. You know, I said I wanted to do laboratory research, and I thought I'd be a researcher. I hated working in the laboratory. I didn't think that was plausible. I gave it one last chance when I was in medical school, and uh, I hated it. And so I made a vow to myself as a medical student, no more lies, only the truth from here on out. And so for a long time, I thought I was going to do private practice. Um, but then, when I went to Northwestern, I started to see things in health policy that actually piqued my interest, and I kind of got into research in the back way. Thank you. All right, that's so much better. Oh, look how happy this thing is. All right, so that's why I did it. All right, any other questions about my background? Yes? Do you think having a background in public health has helped you like, as a physician or like, even when you're like, doing research and your doctorate? Yeah, I mean, I guess I'd say, I mean, I happen to be a professor in the Department of Epidemiology, and if I didn't have a degree in epidemiology, they probably wouldn't give me the job. So, you know, I mean, I think it did help. Um, but most people who are doctors are not professors in the Department of Epidemiology. Yeah. I think the last speaker, I think it sounded like to me, he's a private practice cardiologist. So I think that's a very common path. And even if you're a cardiologist or if you're a hemonc doctor at UCSF, I think I'm the only one who's housed in epidemiology. I think the rest of them are housed in oncology. What does that mean? That means practically they probably um, spend more of their time thinking about oncology research. They spend more of their time kind of in the minutia of individual diseases. And they probably don't teach medical students as often as I do. Um, they don't do as much sort of bigger picture stuff that I do. So, I mean, it's a trade-off. You can kind of choose which department you want to be in. Any other questions? All right. One day I was in clinic. Okay, I thought I'd tell you a story because what, you're supposed to tell some story up here about what it's like. Okay, give you a flavor of it. One day I was in clinic. This photograph is an artist's rendition. This is a pre-med student who came to shadow me, and she drew this for me in charcoal. It's pretty nice, isn't it? I was like, oh, that's great. And uh, there I am in clinic talking to one of my patients. A few things about the photo are off. I don't actually wear a white coat when I go to the hospital. Uh, I actually dress this way. I would dress in a suit because I got a little bit tired early in my career. People saying, you look young. So I need to send the message that I'm not that young, so I wear a suit. Um, the next thing is I don't carry a stethoscope. I'm a hemonc doctor. My only physical examination is a PET CT, so we don't really get into it. No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> you, I see. That joke goes well in a medical audience where people know that you're supposed to do physical exams. All right. Um, so I was in clinic one day, 
And uh, as so often is the case, I was taking care of a 65-year-old woman. My patient's a 65-year-old woman with multiple myeloma, a blood-based cancer, and I've been treating her for several years. And on this visit, somebody else comes to the office with her. Her sister, younger sister, who's 60 years old. The younger sister's got nothing wrong with her. She's just giving her sister company. And as often is the case in medicine, it's the sister, the family member, that asks you the toughest question. She says, doctor, should I increase the amount of exercise I do in order to protect against getting multiple myeloma? You see, my sister has multiple myeloma. I don't want to have multiple myeloma. So do you think it might be sensible to increase exercise to avoid cancer? What do you think, doctor? I said, oh my God, what a question. Uh, exercise, multiple myeloma, what did I know about that? You know, did they teach me that in medical school? So here's the answer I gave her. I said, look, this is the honest truth. I said, you know, I always say exercise is helpful. I love to exercise myself. I'm a big bike rider. Uh, I like to lift weights. Uh, I would do it for general health and well-being, and I would do it particularly for cardiovascular disease. But if you're asking me if I do it for multiple myeloma, I'm not sure about that. You know, but I would do it for a broader pattern of general health, and that's the best reason. You already got a good reason to exercise. Just take that reason and run with it. You know, literally, um, you don't need another reason to do it. And then she fired back with a doozy. Didn't you read the new study? Oh boy, the new study. Didn't you read it? And as you can see, <laughs> had I read it, had I read that study, huh? Oh boy, what a question. Hmm. Because I'm the kind of doctor that reads studies. After all, that's how I introduced myself. And this is the study she was talking about. Getting enough exercise lowers the risk of seven cancers. Seven cancers, it lowers the risk. Which are the seven? You know, I'm a hemonc doctor, and to be honest with you, if you ask me how many cancers there are, I don't even know the answer. I think there's thousands of cancers. There's at least 200 different lymphomas in the new WHO guidelines. There's probably thousands. I don't even know them all. I can't even recite them all. But seven exercise will lower the risk. And the authors here, this paper was based on this study which came out in the Journal of Clinical Oncology that week. It came out on a Monday. It's called Amount and Intensity of Leisure Time Physical Activity and Lower Cancer Risk. And it's exactly what this woman wants. It takes 800,000 people. It follows them from decades, healthy people, and it tries to link how much exercise you do with getting one of 15 cancers. And there's a statistically significant lower risk for seven of 15. Why these 15 cancers, you know? What about all the other hundreds of cancers? I don't know the answer to that question. Eight of them, it looks like it didn't do anything, but seven, it looks like something's going on. So is this one of the seven? That's the question. I pulled up the figure. There you see it, multiple myeloma. That's the one she's worried about. And what you can see here is something called a hazard ratio. Hazard ratio of one means there's no increase or decrease risk. It means it got nothing to do with it. Below one means it's protective. Above one means it's harmful. It's gonna cause cancer. And what you see on the x-axis is the METs, the metabolic equivalents per week someone's exercising. And you see a very clear curve here. As you exercise more, you're less likely to get myeloma, up to 15 METs per week. But beyond that, it looks like, like so many things in life, too much of a good thing ain't good anymore. You know what I mean? You can overdo it and there's no reduction in cancer, right? That's what the figure tells me. And even though I had gone to medical school and I'd been in attending for seven or eight years, I had to admit to myself, when I saw this figure, I didn't even know what a MET was. I had no clue. What is a MET? Anyone know what a MET is? I don't know what a MET is. So I did the honorable thing. I tilted my monitor away from the patient and I looked it up on Wikipedia. <laughs> Wikipedia is very useful for even us practicing doctors. Of course, Wikipedia, okay. And here's what Wikipedia says. It has a big table of METs. You can have light intensity, moderate intensity, vigorous intensity. I told you I was biking every day. I was just running up the METs total. I was probably past 30. You know, I was doing biking all the time, biking hundreds of miles a week, you know? And then I noticed something on this MET chart. Sexual activity was scored in METs, but it was benchmarked for a 22-year-old. And as an older person, I found that deeply offensive, very <laughs> offensive. I found it ageist. <laughs> this is the first time I've ever given this talk to an audience by the median age is 22, okay. <laughs> All right, so I look deeper in the paper and the supplement, it actually separates moderate and vigorous intensity exercises. And as you can see here, the relationship is only true for moderate intensity. That's protective, but not vigorous. Okay, 
So how did I feel? You're telling me there's a relationship between exercise and developing cancer. You looked at 15, or so you say, no more, of course not. Seven, it's true, eight, it's not true. There's a benefit up to 15 hours, but it goes away with 30. It only works for moderate, but don't work for vigorous. Is this plausible, these kinds of results? I felt like this. I felt extremely confused. And luckily I've stock photos of myself in all emotional states, and I was ready to go. Why am I confused? Because I think it's an implausible finding. You know, I'm the first to believe that exercise is linked to better health outcomes, but why should it only be moderate and not vigorous, and why 15 and not 20? It's implausible. The second thing is there's a potential for multiple hypothesis testing. How many hypotheses have been tested, and how many are they telling you about? They're telling you they looked at 15, but I told you there's thousands of cancers. They may have looked at many, many more. And if you look at a lot of things, by chance alone, some will be significant. In fact, the p-value, 0.05, literally tells you if you look at things from which there's no association, how often will you find an association? 5% of the time, okay? There's the issue of confounding. Confounding basically means there might be something else from exercise that causes both things. For instance, if I have rheumatoid arthritis or lupus, I might be both less likely to exercise and more likely to get cancer. So maybe that's the thing that drives both of these outcomes, right? And finally, there's measurement error. This is all predicated on the fact that people are telling you how much they exercise, and people may not be telling you the truth, all right? So when you put all these things together, I think this study has extremely low credibility. And the way I would answer the patient is really what I said in the beginning. You know, I think you should exercise, probably for cardiovascular and general health. I'm not sure it has anything to do with multiple myeloma. And another related question is, just because your sister has multiple myeloma, are you actually any more likely to get myeloma than the average person in the population? That's the first question. Should you even be worried about it any more than the average person? And the answer is, in the absence of certain familial cancer syndromes, usually you are pretty close to baseline population risk. And so actually myeloma shouldn't even be in the top 10 things you're thinking about. It should be the more common ailments that affect people, right? So that's kind of what I counseled her about. All right, so that's pretty much what I do. You know, you see patients, you get some idea, and then you think about some research you can do. We run this laboratory. Uh, we've got a few people on our team here, some medical students, a lot of people from different universities, a lot of people work with us through Zoom, a lot of Europeans. Um, you can go to that UCSF website, you'll see the papers we put out each year. Okay, I thought I'd give you some advice that other people won't give you, and then I'll tell you some other research work we're doing. Um, because I feel like probably everyone's telling me the same advice. I don't know. I, I tweeted out earlier today. I said, hey, I'm going to give a talk to some pre-meds. What advice do you give? A lot of people put the same thing. You know, sleep more. Okay, yeah, of course. I know. Sleep is good. But we all know why you're not sleeping. Because it literally told you to work for 30 hours. What are you going to do? You know? I mean, that's part of why we don't sleep so often in medicine. Um, you know, there are a lot of things people tell you. Okay, here's the things I'll tell you that may be different than what you might usually hear. I wish people, I mean, I don't know if people say this enough. It's a competitive business. You know, I always hear people talk to me about how they want a mentor or sponsor or coach or this or that or how they're not getting what they deserve in life. I hear that from my colleagues. But the truth is, this is an extremely competitive business. I mean, you know, to be, in, to be, a, to be a faculty member, to be at a university, to be in medicine, there are more people who want that spot than there are spots. And no matter what they do, they can take away all the test scores and they're taking away a lot of them. They can take away all the grades and they're taking away. In UCSF Medical School, there are no grades. We don't use step one, it's pass fail. But that doesn't mean it's not competitive. There's just something else people will compete based on. So if you take away test scores and you take away grades, you're left with publications. You're left with research. You're left with extracurriculars. You're left with creating NGOs. You're left with making clubs. You're left with something else. But in anything competitive, people will compete. They will find the metric that defines the competitiveness. That's not how I would do it if I was in charge of the world. I would make medical school a modified lottery Meaning there's a very baseline thing you got to do, like pass this test, get you know, 3.5 GPA or 3. Point, you know, some basic GPA, I don't even know what it is, 3.2 something, some low GPA, and then the rest of the spots we're just going to give away at lottery. That's how I would do it. And I would randomize you to the lottery or to the current system and I'd prove that probably the way we do it is extremely, you know, a time consuming way to allocate spots that doesn't yield better students. So the reason I say this is just that you know, I think there were a lot of movements to eliminate the reliance on test scores, et cetera. But I mean, I wouldn't, I don't think that means it's any less competitive. And sometimes I think it's even worse because when they were step one, 
and that test determined what specialties you could get into, you could study for the test. But now that's gone, and so what specialties you get into is often based on how many papers can you publish in orthopedic surgery, for instance. But that's an opportunity that doesn't exist equally to everybody. People who are well-connected, whose family knows the right person, knows an orthopedic surgeon, they have more opportunities. So in some ways, we've removed the things that were measurable, that we thought were painful, and we've replaced them with much more classist, I think, metrics to separate people. But having said all that, at the end of the day, I mean, for anybody interested in going to medical school, it's still competitive. You're just gonna have, you know, you have, there's no substitute for having to do the things that they're gonna expect of you. And I, that, so that's the first piece of advice. That's a blow. I, you know, I, it is a blow. It's a lot more competitive than when I went to school. I showed you my trajectory. I feel like I might be the last person on earth who literally didn't take a year off. High school, college, medical school, residency, fellowship, faculty, I didn't take a year off. I take a year off when I pass away. You know, I think, and I, no, no, no. I didn't take a year off. I'm not sure that's good, but many students at UCSF take years off. I think, in fact, the vast, I, mean, I have not even met a student that didn't take years off in a long time. And I don't think they take years off because they want to take years off. I think they take years off because they have to take years off to feel competitive to apply to UCSF. And I don't think that's a good thing, to just prolong somebody's perpetual training so that they're competitive. I don't, I'm not sure that's a good thing. Now, if you want to take a few years off and travel Europe and do that, that's fine. But if you, have to, if you have to take two years off to work as a clinical research coordinator or do work in someone's lab, you know, I think that's a problem, actually. Um, I got my first job at the age of 32. There are fellows that are older than me. They're in their, you know, they're, they're fellows that are much older than me who, are getting, who haven't gotten their first job yet. And so I think, are we gonna have medicine be this sort of perpetual training and then you finish and you go on social security? I mean, are, we, are, we, are you gonna finish sometimes earlier in your life so you have something times to, to develop your career? Okay, next thing. I will say, do not aim for career advancement, aim to improve your skills. I think so many people, you know, they tell me like, oh, how can I get this next thing? I say, you'll be much better served by trying to improve some skill. Be better at coding, be better at doing research, be better at reading, be better at writing. If you just try to be, and be better at writing by your own metric, you know? Do you think you're better at writing? And then you'll be surprised that the exercise that goes into that will yield often the result you want to. You'll be more likely to get into things. The way you talk about what you're working on will be more passionate. Time is not proportionate to advancement. I think many people think, oh, if I study for the test for four hours, I'll get X grade, and I study for eight hours, I'll get a better grade. But it's not linear. You can definitely spend too much time working on something. Sometimes it's best to say, I'm gonna do four hours of studying, and then it's over. However much I do, I do. And, if, and don't feel guilty about not having achieved enough. You know, you can always try to make it up the next day. I think you'll be more efficient in those four hours if you give yourself hard stops. Most research is not worth your time. I think nobody is preyed upon more than somebody who wants to go to medical school. And by preyed upon, I mean that you will find a researcher give you some review article to write, some case report, some, something that's like extremely low probability, sorry, extremely low credibility science to work up. And they're kind of taking advantage of your labor, but it's not the most useful thing to do with your time. And I'm not sure it's actually the best paper to publish. There are other things you could be doing. I always tell people, if your mentor publishes less than 10 papers a year, you need a new mentor and your mentor needs a mentor. I mean, I think that unfortunately, publishing papers and doing research is its own skill. And just because someone's a doctor or just because they work at a big name university doesn't mean they have that skill. Only a fraction of people who work in those places know how to deliver research products. It's, a, it's just like, I don't know how to do a cardiac catheterization. He knows how to do that. But uh, he may not know, I haven't, looked up, I haven't looked at him, but I don't wanna pick on him. So somebody else may not know how to publish papers, okay? Because they don't publish papers and publishing papers is a very different skill just like cardiac catheterization. Uh, I think most of what you're told is not true in medicine. The majority of the things that you're learning, basic science, et cetera, uh, basic science is just a very convenient model that tries to explain observable phenomenon and tries to explain the body based on what we know in this year. And those models will undergo dramatic uh, evolution as you go further along. There are many drugs that we don't know how they work, but they work very well, like inhaled anesthetic gases. Um, and our understanding of how things work is constantly evolving, so some things have been revised. So I always think the best people I know are the ones who are like genuinely curious and investigate things themselves. All right, I will pause there.
because the third part of this is something different, more entertaining perhaps. Um, all right, any other, any questions? Everyone here, oh, maybe let me ask you some questions. That will be, loosen you all up. Number one, who here is a freshman in college? Oh, wow, congratulations. On getting into the school, it's a very hard school to get into, isn't it? That's what I hear. Okay, second question, uh, who's sophomore? Okay, a lot of people. Who's a junior? Okay, and who's senior? I'm sorry, you have no time left to, I'm sorry. To, no, no, just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. Okay, great, so you get a mix of all four. And um, in terms of majors, who here is a science major? And who here is not a science major? Okay, what's your major? Um, art and bio. Oh, I love it. And who's the other non-science major? Yes? I'm mostly data science. Data science. That's kind of like science. <laughs> <laughs> no one else? No, no history? No philosophy? No English? That's interesting. <laughs> who here has taken the MCAT? Nobody. Not even the seniors. Who here is planning on going straight through without a gap year? Really, only like three or four people. So now it's thought to be more people think you have to take a gap year. Is that the consensus? You're advised to do that? That's unfortunate. Uh, if you get into many medical schools and one medical school is uh, much cheaper than the other, okay, let's say 50% the price, but the other one is a higher rank, who's gonna go with the cheaper one and who's gonna go with the higher rank one? Okay, cheaper. Okay, higher rank. Okay, the cheaper people are right, actually, on that one. <laughs> All the cheaper people. Because actually, in the long run, with compounding interest, I think you're going to be better off by going with the one that's more formal. That's just my opinion. Okay, that's also what framed my choices, too. Um, okay. Uh, good. And then who here, who here already feels like, oh, I'm definitely going to be a surgeon? Anyone? Yes. Don't be ashamed. Do you? Okay, good. And who here thinks, I'm definitely not going to be a surgeon? Yes, thank you. Let's sleep in. Come on, we don't want to be up at 6 a.m. Are you kidding me? It's not worth it. Let's take it easy. Okay. All right, good. Any questions about... Has anyone, did anyone get advice today that you feel like, I don't know, you felt like, eh, I don't like that advice? And if so, what was that piece of advice you heard? And why do you feel like, eh, I don't like it? Oh, come on. Don't be shy. This is my favorite. Any piece of advice today, somebody said, oh, you guys, you should definitely do this, and you're like, eh, I don't know, I'll pass. Yes? I don't know if you thought I didn't like it, but I was really, like, scared coming out of this whole lecture. Because, like, everybody's like, you should be preparing now. And I'm like, I'm preparing like, now. Yeah. I'm just, just trying to get through physics, man, but I don't know if I can prepare that. That's funny. I'll tell you a little story. When I would go, I'll tell you the story, then you go to the thing. Okay, so the, uh, when I was a student, like a third-year student in um, University of Chicago, my good friend David Strauss decided, as a third-year medical student, he wants to do neurosurgery. And he goes to the, the neurosurgery advisor, this guy's name. <laughs> I shouldn't tell his name. Um, but he was born in the former Soviet Union, and he grew up in the former Soviet Union, and then he trained at Johns Hopkins. So he had had the roughest upbringing you could ever imagine. Johns Hopkins was brutal for neurosurgical training. And my friend David goes to him and says, you know, I decided, I'm a third year student, you know, I decided I want to be a neurosurgeon. I got about a year and a half before I apply. You know, what do you think I should be doing to get a competitive application? And he was like, okay, okay, so uh, uh, your first year? He's like, no, I'm a third year. Oh boys, it's over for you. <laughs> He's like, it's too late. You, you know, you need to come to me as a first year and then maybe then, you know, I can help you. But, it, but third year is, is too late. And so we used to always joke that, um, you know, he didn't go far enough. He's like, you need to come to me, kindergarten or second grader, and if you don't. But I mean, I think people scare you, but don't listen to that. You can always just apply. And he's a neurosurgeon, actually. In fact, David did apply and became a neurosurgeon, despite this bad advice. And uh, then he practiced for eight years, and he did so well for himself, he just announced his retirement, actually, last year. He just retired. Yeah, so there you go. He's a retired neurosurgeon. Yes, your question. Your question. That's a goal. <laughs> I think that's definitely one of them. I think both this and from like other people to, to talk to. I think there are some medical students who are resident residents that are like, if you want to go into a competitive um, uh, career, where, like special like specialty, like neurosurgery, like start pre preparing from the moment you get into med school. Like start like announcing and like networking. That's definitely one of them. I think two is like I appreciate that advice, but I feel like most of the time it's not like specific enough. Well, I, think, I feel like I've just heard it so many times. It's like, oh, like, enjoy the process or, like, balance. Like, balance school. 
And I was like, okay, like how? Well, that's a great point. Okay, so um, one, I think none of you, nobody in this room actually has to worry. You know, I mean, because you did go to a very good undergrad, so you are going to have a huge advantage over all the people applying. Yeah, okay, that's one point, just so that you can take, a, you know, take a, a breath. And then the next thing I'd say about these very competitive specialties is your time will be much better spent really asking yourself if you want to do it rather than trying to do it. Because I think some of these things that sound like the shiniest objects out there, to be a plastic surgeon, a neurosurgeon, sounds so great. I think the more you learn about it, the majority of people who are thinking about it, you might not want to do it when you start to think about the lifestyle, the culture, how the lifestyle is bad for the seven years you train and even sometimes even bad for the years afterwards. And when I'm talking about lifestyle, I'll tell you my friend, you know, not to pick on him, when he was a training, he worked 100 hours a week. There was a classmate of his who was sick. They drove to his house and they pulled him out of his own bed and brought him to work to work. Okay, that was the culture. When he started working as an attending, he still worked from 6 a.m., 5.30, 6 a.m., wouldn't come home till midnight some nights when he was on call. And he worked like that for, you know, the seven years and eight, seven years he trained and then eight years after, 15 years. And to some degree, you know, I say he retired, but he kind of burned out a little bit. He probably will go back in some time. So I think that's very hard. Somebody once told me they interviewed at Duke General Surgery, and the general surgery people at Duke, this was back in the day, they used to proudly say, if you come to Duke, we have a 120% divorce rate because one person got divorced twice. And he said, but, th but that was th what they're saying is the culture was so bad for that training that people couldn't sustain relationships outside of work. So I was like, oh boy, that's something. And then the last thing I'd say about surgery, no offense to the surgeons, and I, and, and I also shouldn't, I shouldn't deny saying this. To me, so, like, it was really cool to watch it the first time, and it was cool to do it the second time. But by the time you saw it for the 25th time, and I can only imagine doing it 200 times, to me it feels like putting together Ikea furniture. It's like, I just kind of want someone else to do that. You know, just go ahead and put that together for me and give me the desk when it's ready, you know? So I mean, I think so, I mean, it's kind of cool, but I also think it's a tedious thing, it's a physical thing. Anyway, that's just my preference, I don't do surgery, full disclosure. But I say all that just to say that don't worry so much about like, you know, can you get into it? The real question is, do you want to do it? Because you don't want to do four years of it and then quit and then have to start all over again and do general medicine. You know, That to me is the worst outcome. Four years, five years. And the attrition rates are a third of people quit in these programs. A third of general surgery. So I mean, it's like not trivial. Yes? Um, in your experience, do you see that students applying without gap year experience are uh, less, uh, or are, sorry, I'm like, are not considered like, does that harm their application if you're applying without the gap year experience? I always tell people, you're not like, I mean, the worst thing you lose by applying and not getting in is the money, which I know feels like a lot, but in the grand scheme of life is a small amount of money, to be honest with you. So I always encourage people to apply, whatever the position is. Like, if you feel like you want to do it and you don't want to do the gap year, and you like apply, and then go, if you get a spot, go. And then sometimes people are like, well, I got a spot at uh, you know, Indiana University Medical School. Maybe if I take a couple gap years real high, I could go to University of Chicago. Uh, I know somebody who did that, and then after five years, they never got another spot. So that's one. Two, there's nothing wrong with Indiana University. A school is as good as what you make it. You can go there and be this all-star, and then you can go to the Brigham and Harvard, and go to you know, go whatever at Stanford next. You, know? you can always, there's so many opportunities to keep going, like I showed you in my thing. There's like another 10 steps to go. So that's one. Two, um, now do they consider it? I, I'm not, uh, not 100% privy to what they, goes into their considerations, but my understanding is what they're very interested in is, it used to be they're interested in the students who are like all the, you know, crushing tests and getting all A pluses, and that, that's over. That's like 10 years ago. They're interested in students who are really passionate about some cause and have some story to explain like why, you know, why they want to do that. And you can definitely prove that passion by taking a couple of years off and doing something, but I think you can prove that passion and tell that story even in the absence of that. If you've done things while you're in college or you have a compelling story, like why, why, this, why you want to do whatever it is you want to do. So I would, my advice would always be just to apply yeah, and see what happens. Okay, any other questions? Should I go forward? Yes.
Mm, that's a good question. Are you interviewing me for a job or something? No. <laughs> that's a job interview. Good, good. No, okay. Mm. <clears throat> so I guess I would, I would just, I would separate the two things in, in your mind. I guess I would say, like, I didn't take any time off. Uh, I don't think that made me better, but I don't think that made me worse. You know, it is what it is. Um, I think uh, had I taken a lot of years off, I think it would have been difficult to go back. I know some people who were, had like very, like, they had careers before they went into medicine, they went back. And I think it's different because medicine is a very sort of hierarchical thing. And so if you're used to people treating you with utmost respect at work because you're very competent, to go back to medical school and find that people often don't treat you with utmost respect because they don't think you know anything, that's difficult. I found that difficult, um, and, but, I, but I think it was extremely difficult for my colleagues who were lawyers and you know, stuff before. Um, but your second question was, well, what about residency? I would say in medical school, like one of the times I struggled, okay, I'll put it that way, the first two years of medical school, I, I wanted to quit, to be honest with you. I was coming out of, like I told you, my major is philosophy. Philosophy classes, like you read very interesting books and you had discussions. I went to a small, I went to Michigan State University, a big school. There's only 12 philosophy majors. Nobody was interested in philosophy. There were more faculty than there were philosophy majors. And what that meant though was that if you were interested in it, like faculty, the faculty I, I know there were still friends. They're still emailing me. Uh, I've stayed in their, like, like their houses and stuff, uh, or at the, you know, like their vacation homes over the years. So it was a very close relationship. Um, you go to medical school, you're just one of 100. So that was all gone. Nobody was ever talking about any uh, good ideas. It was all memorization. Memorize all these parts of the body. Memorize all this pathway stuff. Memorize, memorize, memorize. It's horrible. And so the first two years, I was in a classroom like this for 40 hours a week, forced to memorize nonsense. And I was like, oh my god, I made a big mistake. It's not for me. Then I go third year, you go on the wards. And on the wards, they basically say, show up at 6 AM. And they tell you that these two people, they're your patients. Go talk to them. Figure out what's going on. Come tell me about it. And that's how it starts. And I did that for about a week, and then I was in love with it. And from that moment to the present day, you know, I've all, I just, the, the love of medicine has deepened. But what was it about it? You go to somebody and you talk to them. So you're on your feet. You're not looking at your phone or your computer. You're talking to somebody. They're telling you this story. People tell you all sorts of things they never told anyone in their lives. They confide in you. Then you have to scratch your head and say, well, what's really going on? What's their number one problem? And then you know what? The other doctors are so focused on this because they can measure this. But is that really what they care about? And then, well, what's the evidence for that? Is that really based on good science? Or actually, oh, no, that's kind of, so then like, it leads to all these kind of questions. And then you go on rounds, and people argue. Oh, well, we should do this. And then you say, well, you know what, Dr. So-and-so, what about if we did it this way? We did this first, and then that. And I say, OK, well, OK, yeah. You know, you have a good point. So to me, that was when I started to like it. The first problem solving, social, scientific, all those things came together. Then I went to residency, and I did internal medicine. And then the thing that the tough part was, in the first few months, I had three months with Every fourth night, you did a 30-hour shift. So you work Monday, 6 to 6, 12 hours. Tuesday, 6 to 6, then 6. Then the third day, you do 6 a.m. until like 2 a.m. the next day, 2 p.m. the next day. You work 30 hours in a row. And you do that week after week, every fourth night. It gets very fatiguing. And you become, I think, a different person, more temperamental. And that was when I struggled that first year. But when I was at like my absolute rock bottom moment, there was a senior resident, Nick Firasi. He came to me and he said, you know what, Prasad? He's like, you're looking a little blue. Uh, so he's like, why don't you go just take a quick nap and I'm gonna just hold your pager and I'll just do your work for a few hours. You just go get some rest. I think you've been doing this. You look a little tired, you know? And uh, so I went and then uh, I woke up like, you know, six hours later in the days. I was like, oh my God, what happened? And I came and Nick's like shirt was untucked and his hair was all disheveled. And he was like, we had two people have cardiac arrest while you were asleep. And it was like the worst night of his life. Um, but basically he covered the whole service so he could let me sleep. So I think the fact that he did that for me, I thought was a very nice thing to do. And so I've tried to pay that for it to people. So that was my rock bottom and then he kind of saved me. So I think you'll have a moment like that. But then a after that moment, I never had a rock bottom moment. It was tiring. I think when you go from used to being sleeping every night to not sleeping, it, it, I think it's tough. All right, you wanna hear the last part? All right, I thought this would interest you. This is like some of the research we do. Then we'll be done. Oh, right on. Oh, no, I went way over, didn't I? Oh, shit. I'm way over. You want to be done? Or you want to hear this last part? Last part? All right, all right, all right. Well, you can always be done. You can walk out. That's the other thing I believe. Everyone should attend lectures, but at the moment it loses your interest, you should walk, be free to walk out. But in, unfortunately, we have a system where everyone just watches the lectures on video at the university, so like nobody comes. 
I understand why they don't come. When I was a student, 99% of the lectures I went to were just so awful. I was in the audience like pinching my hand so I didn't fall asleep. It was just so terribly delivered. Um, but I think you do miss out on some good ones, a few ones. Okay, so sometimes when I read the paper, I notice the following. Vitamin E increases all-cause mortality. You see this, right? You open the paper. It's always the same things. Dark chocolate, green tea, berries. It's always a berry, right? <laughs> what about peaches and plums? You ever read an article about peaches and plums? Hell no. Pitted fruit? Get the hell out of here, you know? Berries. Has to be a berry. Has to be a vitamin. Beta carotene vitamin. That's what people want to read about. And so one day you read this, and I go to my cupboard. I open it up. All those gel caps. I just pour that down the toilet, you know? I'm not supposed to do that. But I just pour it out. Because I don't want to die. <laughs> right? But I acted too soon because the next week. Vitamin E mortality study challenge. It actually turns out that it does extend life. Sorry. So you find me in Costco buying the biggest bottle of vitamin E you've ever seen. You've ever seen. Okay. So because everybody knows this happens, coffee's good for you, it's bad for you. When I was growing up, eggs were bad for you, and butter was bad for you, and now it's like, oh, yeah, actually, that was good for you, margarine's bad for you. It's always flip-flopping. And so a lot of people feel like this cartoon, which is called The Random Medical News, from the New England Journal of Panic-Inducing Gobbledygook. This is how they write the news story. They spin the wheel, says coffee can cause, spin the wheel, depression in, spin the wheel, twins. According to a news report released today, coffee can cause depression in twins. It feels that way, right? They flip-flop all the time. It's so random. Why does this happen? Okay, what I'm gonna to argue to you is that for these popular things, like keto diet or whatever, or like saunas or all, the, all this stuff, all these popular, or, or coffee, green tea, alcohol, you will never get the answer in the news that's reliable. It will always flip-flop. And for some, very, for some questions where lots of people care about the answer and we disagree, you will always get both answers for the rest of time. And here is why. It was proven a few years ago by Stanford researchers, I think. I think this is like a very elegant paper. How do we do this research? When we want to know if coffee causes you know, death or extends survival, how do we do it? We go to something called the NHANES Food Frequency Questionnaire, some questionnaire where we give 10,000 people, 20,000 people a questionnaire, and you filled out how much stuff you ate every single day for 10, 20, 30 years. And then we also know whether or not you're alive or dead, right? And so we can do a simple analysis where we ask, what predicts survival? And we typically make a model like this. The Y outcome, the thing we're trying to predict is, is the person alive or dead? And we put a few things in our model to try to estimate if they're alive or dead. The first thing, vitamin E. Eating more vitamin E, is it linked to being alive or dead? After all, that's why I'm doing the research. The second thing, age. Because as you know, people in this room, probably nobody swallows vitamin E. But older people love to take vitamin E. So if you don't adjust for age, vitamin E will become a surrogate for how old someone is and not vitamin E. So we adjust for age. Then we may adjust for sex, we may adjust for race, and you can run this model and you will get a result, vitamin E and mortality. And this is a regression model. This is how most observational epidemiology is done. And this can be published in a journal. And so I will run this model. Meanwhile, the same data set is available to anybody in the world. And my friend in Toronto, she's gonna run the same thing almost She's going to add socioeconomic status because they care about that in Canada, not here. They care about that in Canada. And my friend in South Carolina, she's going to add smoking because when she goes out of the hospital, she sees a lot of tobacco smoke. When I go out of the hospital, I see a lot of smoke, but it's not tobacco. Okay. So she adds smoking. And my friend at Harvard, he's a smarty pants. He got there for a reason. He's going to add BMI and hypertension, diabetes, cholesterol, alcohol consumption, blah, 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 blah. He's going to add all these things. And the point I want to make to you is that every one of these models could be published in a peer review article. Every one of these models can be published. But we're choosing what covariates we think are important in the model. And I am running it, and you're running it. And so here are the truths. One, many investigators have access to the data, and they probe the relationships. We ask more about coffee than we do about milk. We ask more about uh, you know, alcohol than we do about uh, you know sugar-free beverage, uh, uh, sparkling water, for instance. There's some questions that are hotter. Two, everybody who does this work, we adjust for some set of covariates that make sense to us. And so researchers ask, what if you simulate the entire community of researchers? And here's what they found. They took all those things in the NHANES data set. They took all the variables one at a time. And they picked the 13 most common things you adjust for. 
and they adjusted for all 13, each one individually, and every possible combination. So you just you do 8,000 studies. These all could be published in a peer review article. 8,000 different studies. And then they get these clouds. And each one of these, this is like vitamin D, and this is vitamin E, and this is beta carotene. And let me just tell you two things on this. One, hazard ratio. What was that number of a hazard ratio that means it doesn't got anything to do with the other thing? What number? One. One. The other axis shows significance level. It's not the p-value per se, it's actually negative log 10 p-value, but it's roughly the same thing. And what you see is a heat map, and there's all this heat, heat hotspot. Most of the analyses are giving a certain hazard ratio. Can anyone guess what's the most common hazard ratio they're giving when you look at nutritional exposures, like one ounce of blueberries and one thing of bacon? What's the most common association between that and living longer and living shorter? One. And yet, Depending on what you choose in your analytic plans, you can get relationships that so harm or benefit. So now let me ask you, if my researcher, if Allison, who works for me, she gets a one result, she runs the analysis, is she even going to tell me? No. She's going to be like, one is so boring, I'm not even going to bother him. But if she gets 0.85 and it's significant, she's going to tell me. And I'm going to tell her to write it up. And the journal might accept it. And that happens all the time. That's called selective reporting bias or publication bias. And the point the researchers are making is probably the published literature that the New York Times is covering are just one dot on the upper left and one dot on the lower right. And all that heat in the middle, the boring truth of life that most of what you eat or drink just doesn't matter that much. No one is writing that up or publishing it or covering it because we don't think that's sexy or interesting. So the reason it flip-flops is because there's so much analytic flexibility, there's more flexibility than signal. You can get both results just by picking covariates. And the reason you don't see the truth is that there's a disincentive to just say, I didn't find anything so exciting. And so that's why when you take a dart and throw it in a cookbook, that's what they did here. They picked all these random ingredients with a dart, and then they looked up, does it cause cancer or cure cancer? And for 80% of them, you can get both results. Only for bacon does it always cause cancer, and only for olives does it always reduce the risk of cancer. But that might not be the truth of bacon or olives. That might just be because we believe it tastes so good, it's got to be bad for you, right? It might not even be the truth. All right, I won't explain the z-score. Last thing I'd say is analytic flexibility in observational data is so problematic. This was a research study that they did where they took the European Football League, all the football players who played soccer for like a decade, and for every player, a team of researchers looked at their photo and they assigned their skin color, a number from one to five, from light to very dark. And they put that in there. And then the soccer statistics also say if they got a penalty card, a red card. And they gave this research, this data set that says skin color and penalty cards for soccer players to 29 different research teams, which were experts in data analysis, your major. And, <laughs> and they found, they asked him, is there a bias? Are the referees racist? Are they giving more penalty cards for darker skinned players? And for like seven of them, they find that actually there's no evidence of racism. And then for a few of them, they say they're three times more likely to give it to dark skinned players. And then there's a whole bunch of people who find they're just a little bit racist. <laughs> but my point here is the same data set, 29 people, and you get a range of results like they're three times as racist or they're not racist at all. And this tells you there's so much analytic flexibility so much analytic flexibility in the data set that just by picking and choosing what you adjust for, you can get almost anything you want. And so this is the kind of research I'm interested in because I think this kind of research is the problem with research, which is that so much of it is just low credibility um, that you can't really hang your hat on. All right, so future things to explore. You know, I run a YouTube channel and I put out videos on these kinds of topics and then we host this blog called Sensible Medicine, sensible-med.com. It's like a newspaper for doctors and people interested in medicine. I think these two are probably most relevant to you all. I host some more technical things that like, okay, YouTube channel, Sensible Medicine. Drug development letter, I don't know if anyone here is interested in drug development, but we host something there. I have my own observations and thoughts where I talk about all sorts of things. And I have a podcast called Plenary Session. And then I've written a few books and I'm on all these social media things, but okay. Thank you all. I'm happy to stay extra, but you all probably want it Sunday. My God, you've been in this room all this time. Ugh. Kudos to you. Actually, that's probably a very good prognostic sign that everyone here is probably destined to go to medical school. The type of person that goes to Berkeley and comes in on a Sunday to learn about this, yeah, your probability of going to medical school is really high, so I wouldn't sweat it. I wouldn't sweat it. Okay, any last questions? All right, um, and if you want to get a hold of me, 
my email at, you can go to this website and there's a contact me form, or you can email me, which is my first name, vinayak.prasad at ucsf.edu. Thank you.